Amen, my friends. Welcome. It is always a joy to be together on Wednesdays. Uh, I always look forward for Wednesdays. <laughs> it is a joy uh, to be with all of you saints, uh, the people of God, the chosen ones whom the Lord himself uh, have called each one of us to be part of God saved people. Hallelujah. How many of us know that the Lord is our Redeemer? We are redeemed people. We are not just anybody. We are redeemed. Hallelujah. Let us pray to the Lord. And after the prayer, uh, we will be reading the book of Acts chapter 8. 
I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to the end of that chapter 8. And so if there's any volunteer who feels compelled to share this scripture with us, uh, be prepared to read after the prayer. Acts chapter 8, the verses are from 26 through the end of that chapter, um, uh, which is verse 40, 26 to 40 on Acts chapter 8. Let us pray first to invite the, the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Lord, we are grateful. We invite the power of your Holy Spirit to be with us, to prepare our minds, not only to be hearers of your word, but most importantly, to live by your word, to be doers of your word. Help us, our God, as we attempt to share and interpret the meaning of your word something none of us is capable of doing unless you, O oh Lord, through the power of your invisible presence uh, can enable us to do so. Help our minds that are human minds uh, to be prepared enough to accommodate something that is spiritual. Help our hearts be ready uh, to find a place for your word to settle in. And bless every hearer tonight, whether one is on Zoom, Facebook, or YouTube, whether it's on the phone, or any other means. We pray for the enlightening of your Holy Spirit. So our time here together may not be in vain, but truly a spirit-filled moment when we praise and worship, acknowledge, welcome, and celebrate your presence with us. For in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 8. The verses are 26 through 40. Any volunteer who is ready, if you found your scriptures, you might unmute yourself and share the reading of the word. Anybody found it? Brother Reed looks like he found it. Would you unmute yourself and share the reading with us, please? There? Yes, we can hear you now. Uh -huh. Acts chapter 8, 26 to the end. Mm -hmm. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of Ethiopia, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. 
Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb, silent before its shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humi humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asks Philip, about whom may I ask you? Does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak. And starting with, his, with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Lord, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. And both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Asus. And as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news of all to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. That's the reading. Amen. That's the word of God indeed. Uh, we, we are grateful for the word of God and thank you for your um, uh, ability to share your powerful voice as you read this beautiful piece of scriptures in our hearing. You know, this is really a very interesting scenario that we come across here. Um, remember, we are uh, focusing on the book of Acts in order to appreciate and to borrow from the first generation of Christians. Uh, mm -hmm. from their experience of faith yeah. and in their effort to live out the faith, to practice the command of our Lord Jesus, mm -hmm. who to go all the way through the end of the earth and tell everybody about this kingdom of God. Uh, it is an evangelism. We call it evangelism. Anytime you have the courage to open your mouth, without shame, uh, without feeling shy, without hesitating, to tell somebody that you suspect they may not yet have received Christ, and you just become that good Samaritan, that generous person who sees somebody starving and you want to give them whatever you got, you want to share with them. Whatever little bit of water you have left, before that person dies, you want to share uh, a sip of water so they don't die, they can survive. It is the same thing, really, with the Word of God. The difference is the Word of God is spiritual. While as food and water and drinks and what have you, clothes that we share with poor people and other people who are struggling, uh, those are material things. As much generous as you are, uh, you can point to somebody, but that person it's really not going to last long with whatever you gave them. You give someone $10, $1, $5, $100, uh, 200 bucks. Yeah, it's a good generous act, but it, you know it's not going to last forever. It's going to, uh, uh, it's going to be spent. Uh, but when you exercise that same level of generosity, however, with something spiritual, it does not expire. You know, It never runs away. <laughs> the spirit generates blessings from within the heart of that person. It, 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 it enables the person now to live by the word of God. There's nothing better than living by the word. When you live your life only based on things and money, 
dependent upon your family, your friends, your medical personnel, your legal experts, and all the people you trust. <laughs> I am so afraid that one day you're gonna to look to the left and to the right, you're gonna turn your head to the back, you're gonna look straight ahead, and you're gonna find none of those still available for you. None of their help will be relevant. But when one lives by the word of God, my gosh, it does not expire, it does not run out. It's truly the water that Christ promised, water that knows no ending. One who drinks of the water of life, living fountain of life, uh, that person does not become thirsty again. It doesn't mean that uh, all of a sudden you will be rich or you will never get sick or you will always win in the battles of this life. You gotta understand that things of the spirit is not much about this physical material world. It is, a, we call it a spiritual realm <laughs> for a reason. You know, the two things not mix. It's like trying to mix uh, oil and water. You, you will see through the water, the separation. But oh, oil is sitting over there. The water is over there. <laughs> the spirit and matter is not the same thing. Those are two different natures. Uh, we are made up of those two natures, the combination of body and spirit. And so just as much as we are concerned to taking care of our physical body uh, by dressing up of nice clothes, expensive clothes sometimes, uh, we uh, feed the physical body with some nice cuisine, good food. Oh, some people can cook. <laughs> and then we drink some drinks that we like, favorite drinks, whatever it is. And then you really feel good in the end. You relax on our couch and you catch a nap. <laughs> you are done. You are good for that moment. But guess what? After some hours, you're going to feel hungry again and thirsty again. You need to eat again. You want to drink something again. And the, the clothes are going to get dirty. You're going to look for another uh, 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 piece of clothes. I mean, it's, it's, it's endless. It's, it's a constant struggle to keep up with the matter, of the material, of the financial, and of the physical and the physical needs. But the spiritual, however, the only way you take care of it is going to the fountain, uh, to the word of God. This is the only nourishment that matters to the spirit. It feeds your heart, your soul, feeds your mind, it feeds your inner, your inner self. Oh my goodness. Now, we see on this chapter 8, from those, from those verses 26, we are introduced to a few characters there. First, we remember the background that we've got to keep in our mind all the time when we read the book of Acts. Uh, we are looking at the history at the experience, at the lifestyle, at the kind of activity, the consequences, the outcome, the results, all the life. It, it, is, a, it is a life, <laughs> you know, of the first generation of Christian. Why am I calling them the first generation of Christian? Because this is the first group of people who came across the story and the experience of the birth of Christ. You know, most of these people we hear about were alive when baby Jesus was born. Others of them were born in the same period of time. Others were born a little bit later, but they all lived at the same time when Christ lived on earth. And they happen to believe on the message of Christ, not just about uh, the scriptures that prophesied about the Messiah. The Messiah was there now. Uh, the, the prophecy was no longer necessary because the Christ, 
Christ himself, the Messiah himself was present. And one needed not to worry so much about the uh, prophetic accounts because the one that the prophecies were talking about was already there, whether they noticed him or not. <laughs> but this particular group that we call Christians are the ones who happen to actually believe that this man is not an ordinary man like the other man. This one is the one we have been learning about uh, from the Bible. This is the one that the prophets prophesied about, uh, foot foretold about that he was going to be born, he was going to be the savior of the world. This is the one. This is him. You see? Remember the woman on the well in Samaria? Uh, at some point during the conversation, her conversation with Jesus, she realized her eyes were open. She was like, oh! So she ran to the village and she said, folks, all of you come. She was so generous. Said, all of you come down, follow me. Come down to the valley. I found somebody there. There is a man down there who told me everything about my love. Wouldn't this be the Messiah? Must this be the one we've been waiting for? Come with me and see for yourself. And the entire village came. She was a great evangelist. Unafraid, unashamed, not embarrassed at all, not hesitant, not shy. Uh, she courageously preached she never went to a Bible study, you know. <laughs> she was not a pastor or seminar, nothing of that. She was just an ordinary woman who came across the Lord. The Holy Spirit jumped into her heart, and she was motivated. She was moved, uh, uh, and, 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 and she, she, she unapologetically proclaimed. I have a few friends that I know uh, uh, who, who have the same spirit in their hearts, when I go to church, I find them standing by the by the main entrance of the gates of the church, uh, right there by the sidewalk. They are engaging anybody who happens to be passing by. They invite, they have no shame, they are not afraid, they are not hesitant, very lovingly, caringly, patiently, tolerantly inviting people uh, uh, to come to meet uh, this savior. So that way continues. But we are actually following the stories of this first generation of Christians to understand what happened to them after the Lord left. Did they carry on the mission that the Lord commanded? He said, go to the end of the earth and tell everybody, don't be afraid, don't be ashamed. Tell everybody about me. Because if you, are, if you feel embarrassed uh, uh, to tell somebody about me, then I'm going to be embarrassed too to introduce you to my heavenly father when the time of your reward comes. And these people, uh, 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 the questions that we're asking when we read the book of Acts is, did they do what the Lord told them? What happened to them then if they did? What happened to them? Was everything perfect? Because they were doing what the Lord wanted them to do and then everything was perfect in their life. Did they have enemies at all? Why would they have enemies? What kind of enemies, if any? What did these enemies do to them if they did anything? So those are the questions that we are asking. <laughs> and we find answers in this book of, of Acts. Um, we are paying a special attention to that group of men uh, that are, are classified or identified on the scriptures, the New Testament scriptures as the disciples, which means followers, faithful followers permanent, on full-time basis. They were following Christ. That's where the word followers of Jesus uh, uh, entail. That these men were followed. They had no agenda of their own. Once they believed in Christ, when, once they were convinced their heart that this is the Lord, uh, this, this is somebody that comes uh, from God. The things that he talks about uh, is not things of this world. This, this is something really special. So they, they, this, they, these people were normal people like us, you know. They had their family, they, some had their children. I mean, they had their normal lives. They even had jobs and homes. And <laughs> but once they met Christ, they were acting like they are crazy, leaving behind their wives and children and their homes, their towns, and just following this man, Christ. Wherever Christ went, they, they were right there with him. 
They turn to the left, they're right there. And, it, and, and while they were doing that, they were not just following, they were also learning from Christ. They were learning from what Jesus was, was teaching the people, the public, uh, for the miracles that Jesus was doing to the public. And Jesus also had intimate times with that group of men, uh, men and women. Women are not reported, but they were also there, women disciples, you see. And so uh, uh, Jesus had more time with that particular group of permanent followers and, and, and specific instructions and teachings targeted to that group only of followers, the disciples, the faithful ones, as compared to the larger crowd of the believers in general, who would come to a rally or a, a conference or a meeting or a miracle event that Jesus was doing just for that one, and then they would go back to their normal life at home, you see. Uh, but that particular group that we call disciples, those people were like, they, are, they were working full time for Jesus. They had a full commitment uh, 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 of, of serving Jesus Christ. So that is the group that we are particularly interested in to, to, to explore, to find out, to research, to inquire of their life uh, uh, and, and what happened to them. They were so close to Jesus, you know. Jesus told them at one point that, you are no longer just uh, uh, believers, or you are my friends. You know, you are my friend. <laughs> mm -hmm. And 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 Jesus, at another instance, he said that you know what, wherever I find myself to be, you all gonna be there with me also. I'm gonna make sure that where I am, you also. Uh, uh, uh. In other words, Jesus was ensuring them that their ties, their relationship. The relationship that an ordinary human being develops with God through faith, that relationship is never going to be ended or broken. Okay? <laughs> so Jesus is granting them that, you know, I, 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 he said those words when he was about to be taken back to heaven. He said, I may be leaving you for now, but trust me, wherever I am, you will be there also. And those promises of Jesus apply to you and to me too, to all of us who are faithful believers, intentional followers of Jesus Christ. We do not follow Christ by accident because we had some kind of a miracle experience. Maybe we were sick, somebody prayed over us and, and all of a sudden uh, cancer could no longer be found. And then now we believe, but we're living our normal lives. We don't really uh, uh, care so much about what to do concerning Jesus. This is intentional believers, uh, Christians who uh, uh, know that my purpose of life is to follow my Lord and my master. Whether I'm still alive on this world or not, I have a goal in my life. My goal is to do, will, to do the will of one who brought me to this earth. So those kind of people are serious in their faith. They are not accidental Christians. They are not circumstantial Christians. <laughs> you know, they are not just momentum Christians. You know, when there's a moment going on, they're there raising their hands, clapping and dancing and feeling happy about God. But then that's it. After church, that's it. It's over. Until next Sunday. The, 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 this, this type of Christians that we are learning from they had a full commitment of faith to God. They were not after any particular thing. They just wanted to serve the Lord. They wanted to do anything they could. Now, we are interested in finding out what happened to those people after the Lord left this world. Uh, did they become millionaires? Did they become so rich? Did they become famous? If they became famous, under what circumstances? Was was anything weird and did anything bad happen to them? Did anybody hurt them? Why and how? And how did they react? Did they have enemies? If you are a good, faithful Christian, would you ever have enemies? And you see, so most of those answers, our, our questions are answered as we look at the book of Acts. 
verses 26 through 40, the book of Acts chapter 8, uh, we find some, some characters there. One is Philip. Who is Philip? Philip was one of the faithful followers of Jesus Christ. He was one of the preachers, you know. Uh, he had committed his life uh, to Jesus Christ. And then second character we hear about that is essential for this particular uh, uh, part of the scriptures is one who is described and introduced to us as an Ethiopian official. <laughs> an Ethiopian official. Uh, in Ethiopia, there was a queen of the land. Uh, we are given her the, the name of the queen. The name of the queen is Candace. <laughs> what a name, Candace. So now, uh, uh, this man, uh, this man, this official that is 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 also uh, uh, identified as the the eunuch. Uh, 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 that's the title, but it's not really his his actual name. That is a uh, it's an identification by title. He was a treasurer. But, you know, treasurers are not just anybody. Those are people who gain trust of the people who are in charge of institutions, organizations, businesses, uh, religious organizations, churches, uh, and what have you, associations. And so they, they play a very essential role in the organization by being the stewards of the most important treasurers of that particular company, organization, uh, 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 association, whatever it is. And so those are people who, uh, 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 you know, who are highly trusted. Uh, because if you ever make the mistake of putting uh, somebody who does not deserve that trust, uh, you're gonna end up, the company or organization, institution is gonna end up in a terrible disaster. You know, <laughs> you want to go bankrupt, <laughs> not because the resources are not there, but because the resources have been mis mismanaged and uh, ill-managed uh, and, and, and all kinds of, of, of problems. So this man met approval of a queen. That is the institution, uh, the queen of the land of Ethiopia. And, and, and she had severe trust on this gentleman. And, and and so uh, uh you know uh, uh, he was he was the treasure very important man uh in the in the in the in the governance of that of that Ethiopian uh, 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 uh you, you know Ethiopian uh, nation so now what happened now is that this very important official highly trusted it and entrusted the most important part of the treasure of that nation, uh, given his position as the treasurer, uh, he is also a believer. Uh -huh. <laughs> he happens to be a believer. And now he is coming to the center of Christianity at the time. The center of Christianity at the beginning is exactly where Christ was born. That became the center of Christianity, the, the heart of faith. Even before Christ was born, the, the, the center of faith, anything to do with the divine God of heavens, was really the same place. <laughs> was the same place, the land of Israel, the Palestine, uh, 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 especially the side of Israel uh, 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 that was... Uh, uh, that was headquartered by the city of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem became like the, the you know, the, the merging point of, of, of uh, that kind of uh, Judaism. We call it Judaism or Judaic religion, which began of Abraham, who was a Jewish guy, and his wife, Sarah, and all of that story. So, so th that, that, that is Judaism. Judaism is not the same as Christianity. Jesus was born as a Jew, so he was part of Judaism uh, in that regard, but he did not settle with Judaism or, or Jewish religion that was fundamentally based on the teachings of the Old Testament because Jesus Christ came 
to fulfill the, those teachings of the Old Testament. At the same time, he was starting a new page, which we now know as the New Testament or the New Covenant, or you could say the Second Covenant, uh, taking the First Testament or the, what we popularly know as, referred to as the Old Testament. You can also call it the First Testament or the First Covenant. <laughs> you see, <laughs> now there is a Second Covenant. That Second Covenant does not begin with Abraham. The first covenant begins with Abraham, the calling of Abraham by God, and all the promises God made with, with Abraham. And Abraham believed and followed, obeyed the command of God. So that was a covenant, the first covenant. The second covenant is the one that begins with the birth of Christ. And the birth of Christ is a fulfillment of the promises of the first covenant, you see? Uh, uh, and so a new page starts with Christ. There is a new agreement, a new covenant. This new covenant or second covenant that we call New Testament or Second Testament, whatever, uh, uh, that covenant, it is a covenant based not on one man and one woman, or, 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 I mean, one God and one human being, God, divine one, and the human being Abraham, who was chosen. No, this the second covenant has nothing to do with just one person to one person uh, and, and, the, and the descendants of that uh, human person. The second covenant is extended, is an extension, is a continuation of the first, but it is in a more extensive form where God does not only call one human being called Abraham, and make deals and promises to that person and the children of that person. The New Testament, it is a call by God that is extended to each and every person that is willing to enter into that covenant. Are you with me? <laughs> so that covenant is very active and alive because God continues to call and anyone who responds and accepts Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the Lord and the Savior of the world, then uh, uh, that person enters into that covenant, enters into every promise of that second covenant, which is inheritance of the kingdom of God. That is where we are right now. We are still living under that era of this second covenant. Now, these people were faithful, honest followers of Christ. What happened to them? Well, we have seen what happened to them on the uh, from uh, uh, chapter one up to to chapter seven. But uh, uh, but now, when we look at verse twenty six of chapter eight, we find that Philip, who's one of the uh, the faithful ones, and this man this government official uh, in Ethiopia uh, who was had the position of treasurer believed also, you know. And so he was coming back, going back home, coming from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the heart of the center of Christianity. Uh, and Jerusalem was also the center of Judaism. Center of Judaism. But now Christ was born out of that religion, Juda Judaism, or Ju Judaic religion. Christ is born, and Christianity is born. And Christ now uh, uh, begins to clarify matters between Judaism as a religion and Christianity, which is the teachings of Christ. And so he's coming back from Jerusalem the heart of Christianity, and at the same time, the heart of Judaism. <laughs> and he's reading the scriptures. Now, God is using this, this faithful follower, Philip, uh, to help that man who is coming back from church on a Sunday morning, when their case was Saturday, right? Uh, the, the, the Jewish people, 
uh, were not worshiping God on a Sunday. They, were, they worship God on the Sabbath day. Sabbath day. So he's coming back from church on Saturday. But even though he left the church, he did not pack up his Bible and forget it on his, in his, on his bag. He's still reading it on the way home. <laughs> How many people do that? <laughs> you know, most people are like, well, the service is done. So why should I still bother with the Bible? But this guy, no. He continued. Uh, so whatever they, they were preaching about at the church, he might have gotten some kind of confused. He wanted clarity. Or maybe it was not about what they preached about at the church, but he was just that type of Christian who you cannot separate them from their Bible. Whether they are admitted at the hospital, they are taking their Bible with them. If they forget, they will ask the hospital staff, excuse me, do you happen to have a Bible here? And, and, and if you go visit them, you'll notice they have their Bible right by their bedside. That was that type of Christian, that type of faithful person. He's reading his Bible, but he has, he has no understanding of it. He's confused. <laughs> and so God notices him. I'm telling you, if you are seeking God, God is going to notice you. There is nothing can do that is hidden in the eyes of God. What is good or bad, God notices it. God sees everything. God sees a good act of somebody who is hungry for the truth. Somebody who is actively seeking the Lord. The word of God says, seek the Lord while the Lord can be found. <laughs> if you seek the Lord, I promise it doesn't matter who you are. If you actively are in search of the Lord, you are concerned, you want to find God, you want to encounter God, you want to experience God, I guarantee you, God is going to reveal himself to you. God is going to reveal himself to you in, in, in any way that God chooses to reveal himself. To you. you will be fulfilled in your soul. So this Antioch is coming from the church, the heart of Christianity. By the way, the heart of Christianity, the scent of Christianity, has long moved from Jerusalem. <laughs> uh, first to Europe, and then from Europe to move to America. And that's where you find in America, uh, you, you'll find so many churches. Every block has a church, every block. Because the, 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 the scent of Christianity moved a long way ago. Uh, from from uh, from uh, Jerusalem to Europe, and from Europe moved over time to America, and America was really the center of Christianity at some point. They sent out missionaries all over across the globe, and dot 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 dot. <laughs> but guess what? Right now, as we speak, from a couple of years back up to now, the center of Christianity has has kept has kept itself in on the go has also moved from the United States to Africa up to this very period of time. Uh, the center of Christianity is said to still be in Africa, uh, which means that those, uh, uh, that is the region where most people are, are becoming Christians by the night. Uh, and, and most people are, are still enthusiastic uh, about God. Come Sunday morning, Everybody, every way, every avenue will end up in church, just like it was uh, some time ago here in the United States and some time ago in Europe and some time ago at the beginning of Christianity in Jerusalem. So that's why this guy was coming from the church in Jerusalem and, and, and he is seeking understanding. Now, God notices this treasure and sends his agent, <laughs> if you believe in God and you surrender to God and you say to God, Lord, use me in any way that I can be of help to you, to your project of bringing salvation to humanity. I'm here. I don't know anything. I am not equipped. I'm not prepared. I'm not a pastor. I'm nobody. I am just somebody who believes very strongly in your name. And I believe that you will find a way to use me. Use me, Lord. Doesn't mean that you have to give up your job and become a pastor or anything like that. The Lord is going to use you exactly the way you are, exactly who you are, exactly where you are. The Lord is going to use you. So this guy, Philip, was one of those who said, Lord, use me in any way. So, And God used him here. He sent him 
to meet the need, to answer the prayers of that treasurer. And so uh, 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 the man of God, Philip, went uh, to the direction that God directed him, and he, he did not know why was God, God's spirit moving him to go that direction. And then there he, he noticed that uh, a guy that seems to be a government official he was surrounded by his chariot and you know the horses and servants and all of that. So he knew that was someone of it was an official, a convoy was there from the from the queen. And so and so he went by and and the guy, uh, uh, the important guy is seated in his chariot, is reading the script, but he's breaking his head, he can't understand. And so the man of God is led by the Holy Spirit to intervene and say, Hey, excuse me, sir, uh, do you? Uh, I mean, uh, 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 do you understand what you're reading there? <laughs> I can see that you're reading the, the Bible. Do you understand what you're reading, though? <laughs> Very interesting. It takes a lot of courage to do that. This man is not an ordinary man. He's a government official. You know? And who told you that if somebody is important according to the human standard or social status, economic status or political status, who told you that just because that woman or that man is seated in that office, has that title that is important. That person does not deserve the grace of God. That's the question we all got to ask ourselves because we have a tendency to shy away when we see people that we believe they are important, especially government officials. We shy away and, 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 and we, we, we act like they are not human like us. We act like they don't deserve we judge them like they don't deserve to be saved. You know, these government positions will not take anybody to heaven. If that government official has no faith in the Lord, Jesus said one thing. He said, if, if anyone has the child of God, the son of God, that person and that person alone has life eternal. But if anybody does not have the, the son of God on their heart, they have no kingdom of God as well. They have no life, in other words. So everybody, don't be deceived by titles and, and positions and jobs. That's just how a person makes a living. Some are government officials. Others are these. Others are fishermen. We all are in different industries. <laughs> but no one should be excluded from the opportunity of an invitation for life, an offering of Christ. So this man was like, excuse me, sir, I see that you, you are reading. And, and I know you're important. Oh, my goodness, uh, of all due respect, sir. But I just want to ask you a question. Do you understand what you are reading? <laughs> How many times did you read the Bible and you really got thrown away, confused? More confused. And you ended up with so many questions. Do you understand what you are doing? I know you are coming from church. Uh, the serves must have been good, uh, and, and you're continuing to read the Bible, which means the service was provocative. The sermon was, uh, was thought-provoking. You want to understand, but do you understand? And he was very honest. Some people are too proud to admit that they don't know something. They want to act like they know everything. They want to give you an impression that they don't need help. They don't need you. <laughs> They're too important. They know everything. Just because you have an important position in the government does not mean that you understand everything. Now, this man was very honest. He said, how can I understand if nobody explains it to me? Impossible, right? So the Holy Spirit uh, 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 really was with Philip because that man, he, he seems to have understood that Philip, who was asking him this question, do you understand what you're reading? Uh, this government official seems to have understood that this is not just any ordinary man. This is a man of God. And he right, right away, without wasting time, he invites him to jump in. And they sat side by side as they continue to travel together. And then uh, 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 Philip, of course, took the opportunity to evangelize that man, uh, to, to offer clarity. Uh, the the, the the, the official, the government official was struggling to understand but that passage about uh, uh, from Isaiah uh, when I was talking about 
uh, uh, the writer, the prophet Isaiah was writing about his own self or what, but obviously he was not uh, because uh, they are saying that uh, they are talking, obviously they are talking about the Lamb of God uh, who is uh, being punished without complaining, uh, being dragged to the cross without fighting back. And they are using the a poetic example of a lamb, you know. You know, the lamb is a very interesting creature. <laughs> doesn't complain much, doesn't resist much. <laughs> the, the lamb will do anything. Uh, 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 you can slaughter the lamb and it's not going to fight as much as a goat or any other animal would. You know, if you don't watch out, they will kick you to death uh, trying to fend for themselves. But the lamb has some natural qualities of peace. You see, that's why that animal is used a lot symbolically in events and rituals of peace uh, because of, of the nature of that animal. So Christ here is poetically, uh, comparatively placed uh, uh, as a lamb. The scripture said he is the lamb of God. That, that choice of the lamb, animal lamb, speaks to those natural qualities of the animal, the lamb that offers no much resistance. You can do almost anything to the lamb and the lamb is not gonna resist. So the lamb of God, meaning Jesus Christ, who has all the power, unlike the lamb, uh, Jesus Christ actually has the power to resist and to fight back and to win. But rather than doing that, Christ chooses to, to kind of like let go of his ability to fight back in order that uh, the promises of God can be fulfilled in our lives. Uh, we have to be saved by the blood of the Lamb of God uh, uh, because that Lamb of God uh, has a holy blood, meaning is innocent, has no sin. So we needed to be saved by the blood of one who is completely pure, innocent, and actually holy. You see, <laughs> not just somebody who is exempt from mistake. He is holy uh, by nature and so that's why they are using that example there whenever you hear that a language of uh, talking of Jesus Christ as a lamb they are invoking those aspects of peace and and the the willingness of Christ not because he's incapable of because he's willing uh, to die for us he's willing he's volunteering he wants to suffer for us he wants to be sacrificed for, for our benefit. He wants to save us. And, and so, but that really confused the reader there. And, you know, uh, uh, he, he, was, he was persecuted and did not fight back. Uh, uh, they're they, they, they beating him up, but he's not even crying. <laughs> they're they, they doing all kinds of you, but he's not displaying his divine power for self-protection. He's willfully and willingly you know, entering and going through those experiences of torture and even uh, uh, death uh, for our sake. And in the end, of course, uh, as they continue on the journey, uh, they, they say that uh, uh, the, the government official noticed that there was some kind of water there. Uh, I don't know whether this water was in a well. It was most likely a lake or maybe a, a, a tiny river, I don't know. But there was water, that's, that's evident. Uh, there was water. And so he, he asks the man of God, uh, why should I not be baptized? Is there anything that uh, uh, would prohibit me from being baptized? You are the, the, the servant of God, you are here with me. And I know by experience that you would need water to baptize. And water's right here. <laughs> Why should I not be baptized? And he was immediately baptized. Now, the, the last episode there, of course, remember that baptism, it is a mark. It is a symbol of that transformation. You know, uh, as a symbol of that born again aspect. <laughs> yeah, everybody needs to experience that rebirth in spirit, okay, as a, as a symbol, as a mark of change uh, from the previous course of life that was headed to, to hell, eternal death, 
to a new life, a new direction, a new destination that is headed to life eternal. So there is a shift here. Without Christ, we are automatically headed to hell. Okay? But once we surrender our lives to Christ, we experience this transformation. Repentance is a transformation, is a change of course, is a change of destination from being headed to a lost destination to being redirected to a life destination. <laughs> you see, so baptism is a mark, is that symbol that represents that moment of shifting. You see, it is a shifting moment. So the symbol of that shifting is baptism. But baptism in itself is not the end. It's only the beginning. You still gonna need, you're gonna have to walk the walk of faith. Amen? It's not automatic. Baptism marks the beginning, that moment of shifting. But you're gonna have to keep walking into the new destination without trying to come back to the lost direction that will take you to hell. You gotta keep going on the new destination. Stuff will happen. Things will happen along the way. It is a journey. You see, it's a journey. Just like the Israelites, they were told by God that they will be given a better land to live in. One that had manna and honey and milk and all that, and all those kind of beautiful promises. But how did they get there? And how long did they take to get there? 40 years in the desert. You see, and, 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 and that's even a shortcut. Uh, if you consider all the generation that were born and died before they got to the destination, from the time Abraham was called, up to the time when uh, 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 Moses, uh, uh, actually not even Moses, his 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 replacement was Aaron, right? Uh, I don't remember. I don't. I don't remember. You 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 all good people, good Bible people, tell me who actually led the people into the land. The promised land. It was not Moses. <laughs> okay, it was not Moses. Somebody that was working as an assistant to Moses, working closely to Moses, is the one who 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 now helped the people to cross the Jordan. And that person set foot in the promised land with the people. Not Moses, who did all the hard work, negotiations in Egypt with the pharaohs there and. And, and then joining all these troubled people, tr difficult people to lead along the way for 40 years. He did not set foot in the promised land. <laughs> you see, so so it, 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 just because you've already been baptized, it does not mean that you're already in heaven. You still need to walk a long walk, a long journey of faith, a, a journey of endurance, ups and downs and frustrations and sicknesses and, and and I mean all kinds of trouble along the journey. All of those things are there in the journey awaiting you one blocking stone after another for a reason. The Lord is preparing you. The Lord is preparing me. The Lord is preparing us for what lies ahead, for the beautiful destination that awaits us ahead. We gotta go through this pruning. It's like being pruned by all these difficulties, all these illnesses, all these deaths, all these, um, uh, I mean, all kinds of trouble, all kinds of situations. It, it's, it's preparing us uh, to the destination. It's part of the journey. It's not the end. It's part of the journey. And so uh, uh, the, the important official was baptized, was very happy. But now the last episode in that lesson is that, I don't know if you noticed, the, those, the final verses there, they say that after the baptism took place, God took away Philip in a miraculous manner. None of the people who were there of this government official actually can tell how or where did Philip go. 
disappeared. <laughs> Baptism was done. The, 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 the explanation, the Bible study was done along the journey on the chariot. And now it ended with baptism, which is a symbol of conversion and all of that. But now Philip disappeared. And Philip was, was, was seen elsewhere in another community, another neighborhood far away, doing the work of God there also. Now, I just want us to, to, to pay attention to, to that fact. What happened? How did Philip disappear? And why did he have to go away? It, it looks like it was not really his choice or anything. F Philip was does not appear like he was following his own personal calendar, or personal agenda, his own planning. It looks like he was really being led by God. First, he was led by the Holy Spirit to come on that road that this uh, government official was traveling on. For a reason. Now we understand why God led him there. God wanted to save that man. Because that man was actively seeking God. Even though he was a government official, many people when they have these positions or big jobs, they think they don't need God anymore. You know, when somebody gets a lot of money in the pocket, they think now they don't need God. For what? When somebody so rich or so healthy and strong, they don't think they need God. For what? I don't need God. I'm healthy. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good, Pastor. I'm good. <laughs> but that man, with all of his importance in his organization, in this case was a, uh, was a government, uh, he knew that he needed God. He knew that none of those positions, the money that he was managing, the trust that he had from the queen and all, none of that would save his soul. He actively searched the Lord. And because of that, God sent somebody to help him connect with the Lord. And he was actually baptized, officially introduced into the family of Jesus Christ. Born again. But now, once that task is completed for Philip, the Lord takes Philip elsewhere. <laughs> There's no rest, buddy. There's no time for him to remain there to get the praises and the appreciations and all of that. No, 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 no. Because who supposed to take the honor and glory and praise and worship? It is God and God alone, not the one who does the work of God. That's just a tool, just an instrument. Remember, we are just vessels. Once you have completed your job, when you have done what the Lord has commanded you to do, don't you linger around to try to catch some praises now, huh? Hey, remember, it's me who uh, invited you to this church. Yeah, don't forget me. <laughs> hey! <laughs> now you are trying to steal the credit. You are trying to steal the place of God now. You are a vessel. You are an instrument of God. It is through you that God accomplishes God's mission. What is God's mission? Is to bring everybody into the kingdom of God. Once you have done your job, you do not try to get any credit out of it. Disappear from the rudder. Go to your next mission. Ask the Lord, Lord, thank you for using me uh, uh, to, to get this done for you. Now, what's my next assignment? And the Lord is going to take you to your next assignment. In the case of Philip, who was taken to his next assignment, he found himself preaching the gospel uh, to the people in a different area. Philip later appeared, that's verse 40. Philip later appeared in Azotas. <laughs> he, he went from town to town all the way to Caesarea telling people about Jesus. That's the only mission. And that mission is active and awaiting all of us still. Go from person to person, from community to community. Tell them about Jesus and then get out of the way. Go to a next assignment. Now, the Lord 
looks at you and at me today as the Philip of today. <laughs> you know, it's not an easy mission, you know. And you really have no excuse. You can't say, oh, no, I'm not a pastor. No, 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 no. I, no, 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 no. You can't use that as an excuse. <laughs> you see? Uh, you can't use that as an excuse uh, as an excuse at all. You, my friend, uh, together with me, all of us were in the same boat. The Lord expects from us uh, a results. Results. The results we are to produce for Christ is bringing more people into the fellowship with Christ so that they can end up in heaven. Uh, may the Lord bless us. This is really a very missionary book. I love the stories. I love the story. I find a lot of resemblance of us and a lot, a lot of, uh, 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 of similarities to what we are expected to do. It is a practical book. It's an action book. This is not a type of book that just tells you about stories of the ancient time. This book is action book. It's, 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 it really requires of you and me an action. <clears throat> an action. You can't be shy. You can't be afraid. You can't be intimidated. And don't listen to the cheap talk of other people. They are not your, your, your savior. They are not your master. They are not the ones who, who sent you to the place where you now stand. You are wherever you are. You are there for a reason. You are there for a mission, not by accident. And the Lord wants you to, to use every talent you've got uh, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of this world. Imagine if everybody becomes a Christian, you know, the life in this world will be, will be different. This is going to be a better place to be in, right here on planet Earth. When everybody has a peace, a dose of Christ in their heart, you want to see less evil, less crime, less robbery, less dishonesty, uh, and, and, and less spirit of opportunism, you know, of trying to take advantage of the situation. You, you're going to see more of Christ, more of, 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 of the kingdom of God being lived out right here on earth. So don't you give up. <laughs> I hope you find some encouragement from this, uh, uh, from this story of the first generation of Christians. And God bless you, my friends. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine upon you and upon your family. Uh, may the Lord be seen by you, be heard by you. And may the Lord hear you, may the Lord see you, uh, and may the Lord bless you in ways you have never ever imagined uh, in your life. And let it be so in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, there was an announcement that I was supposed to, I had in mind to share uh, with us. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't, I, it just, it just it slipped, slipped away from my mind. Uh, so I'm just going to ask you to continue to pray for a successful gathering, a spirit-filled uh, conference session of the New York Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church in Connecticut from Friday to Sunday. Um, we have been doing different pieces of it. Uh, online and 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 this this last week, uh, I was in Connecticut for uh, a couple of hours the entire morning of another piece. So we are doing it piece in piece because when we gather, we are not gonna be staying there long like before. So we're gonna only gonna stay for uh, Friday, Saturday, ending with the service on Sunday morning. And that's it. So please pray for our Bishop Bickerton. I pray for all of his cabinet uh, members and the staff of the conference, all of our pastors and all of our uh, lay delegates who will be there to represent uh, the, the local congregations. Amen. Good night, my friends. <laughs>